Hello, welcome back. I'm Masood Raja, and in this lecture, I will build up on my previous lecture on Eagleton's chapter three. I'd mentioned there that I might do a supplement um, entry lecture to add a little much, bit more detail uh, towards the second part of the Eagleton chapter on structuralism and semiotics. And it starts on page 92 where he goes on to explain as to what were the gains of structuralism as literary movement and what were the responses to it and its major flaws. I briefly touched upon them in the previous lecture, but I thought I should build on that and see how Eagleton argues his points. So on page 92, he st starts with, uh, and I quote, loosely subjective talk was chastised. So this is what he's talking about, um, structuralism. And uh, literature was seen as a construct, right? And it, that it harbored a vital essence, a soul, which it was discourteous to tamper with, was rudely unmasked as a bit of disguised theology. This whole idea that literature had a, an inherently untouchable essence right, which is deeply connected to humanism was kind of destroyed. And then what comes in structuralism is um, that there is nothing natural about it, right? And there is a strong critique of common sense, right? So structuralism by insisting that there are deep structures that determine the meanings of a text or a value of a text already enabled us to dispels, dispel any pre-established commonsensical ideas about the integrity of literature and all. And Eagleton goes on to explain it further. Um, so one of the points that he gives is, is the, the structuralist emphasis on the constructedness of human meaning represented a major advance. Meaning was neither a private experience nor a divinely ordained occurrence. It was the product of certain shared systems of signification. Now this is on page 93. How do we reach this conclusion? So if you go back to what I discussed about Sushur, right? And his splitting of language into long and parole, right? And long is the system which he studies, right? So if we believe that it's the system that lends meaning to an individual utterance, right? Then if we extend it to literariness on literature, we already know that the value of literature is not in the words on the page or their originality, but the deeper structure against which we understand it. It's that structure that determines meaning for us. Right, So I don't bring my individual sensibilities or meaning to a text. I can only do that if I'm privy to the structure. And for that, I have to understand the structure. Otherwise, I will not be able to read the text. So my own ability to interact with the text is then in so many ways over-determined by the structure within which the text is posited. So. The second quote on page 94 is where Eagleton is saying, structuralism scandalized the literary establishment with its neglect of the individual, right? Its clinical approach to the mysteries of literature and its clear and incompatible ability with common sense. So what are some common sense, sensical ideas about literature, right? If you think in humanistic terms, is we thinking that we make all the meanings, that we can, things as they appear, can mean something to us, right? Or we can perceive them, right? But we already know that so many things that are commonsensical, the sun rises, right? The sun sets. We know scientifically that our perception is wrong. The sun doesn't rise, the earth revolves around it or revolves around its own axis, right? So structuralism then basically is telling us that literature is not what you, me and others read into it, right? 
So any kind of humanism, the belief that what is most real is what is experienced and that the home of this rich, subtle, complex experience is literature itself, right? What structuralism does is, it says is your experiencing of literature is not what is meaningful. What is meaningful is understanding the deep structure of a text because only then you will know the meanings. It's just like as uh, Eagleton is quoting Freud there, Freud saying that even our most innermost experiences can be rendered differently depending on if we understand the structure of the psyche better. Why do I do a certain thing? Is it at the instant? So for example, if I get angry, that's an act of parole. Do you read it like that? Or if I constantly remain angry, is that part of my essence? Or is there something in my unconscious, which is a deep structure that is forcing me or making me act a certain way? So we always then in structuralism are looking beyond the sign itself, right? So what he says is structuralism broke with conventional literary criticism in many ways. But it also remains preoccupied with language, right? as radical as it might. And at the same time, it has language itself remains the main obsession huh, of literary critics who are performing structuralism. What are they doing looking at the deep structures of language? And Eagleton, being a Marxist, is saying, you know, what about? labor, sexuality, political power, don't they have a bearing on the deep structure which we are trying to read in a literary text? So despite the revolutionary potential of structuralism, of unmooring the privileging of the words on a page and forcing us to go and look at the deeper structures within which those words mean something, by constantly remaining focused on language itself and on the text itself, structuralism fails to notice certain other things. Like, what is it outside of a text? What is it not necessarily outside of a language, but our place in the world, our class, our gender, our sexuality, right? The class structure within the text is produced or consumed. All of them have a bearing on reading a text. But structuralism doesn't really go there, right? Then what he goes is, OK, if we go simply by structure, what about the concept of literature as a social pra practice, as a form of production, you know, as a form of production, which in, not in a reflectionist way, but which carries with it the social structure within which it was produced, right? Uh, but structuralists would not go there because that for them meant that they would then go to an originary moment. They could say this is where the text originated. Now remember, if we are tracing the deep structure, all we have is signs upon signs within a given system. Right, And we have already sort of obliterated the idea of an autonomous human subject who can make statements because statements. So the debate is, you know, do we emerge in language and speak it, right? Or do we exist because we have language which speaks through us? So if you have become as a human being, as a sign who can only be differentiated from others through difference, and, and if then you can mean only indifference to other signs, there is no possibility of an originary moment when a certain thing starts. And hence, instead of going out and locating the text within the social where it is produced, the structuralists constantly are looking at the text and its structures on. I think that's the point that Eagleton is trying to make over here. So that takes us to the what Eagleton describes as the anti-humanism of structuralism. So I'm going to read this from page 
98 first. For the humanist tradition, meaning is something that I create or that we create together. But if we are structuralists, how could we create meaning unless the rule which govern it were already there, right? That's a question from structuralists. However far back we push, however much we hunt for the origin of meaning, we will always find a structure already in place. This structure could, have been, could not simply have been the result of speech, for we were, were we able to speak coherently in the first place Without it, we could never discover the first sign from which it all began. Because, as Saussure makes clear, one sign presupposes another from which it differs. And that another, to be able to transmit a message at all, a person must already be caught up in and constituted by language, right? So this idea of a centered human being, which privileged my individual language, my individual speech, and hence centered me as a human subject comes to crisis. Because even if I speak, my utterance, where does it come from? What lends it meaning? Not me, of course, right? A shared code, right? And that shared code is the structure of language within which I speak. So then, in a way, there is no possibility of my own individual utterance because I utter it and it makes meaning, it becomes meaningful because of this inhuman system that exists outside of me. And that is what he means by the anti-humanism of the structuralist movement, right? There are quite a few responses, you know, um, to structuralism. Uh, the most important being Mikhail Bakhtin, right? Because uh, he was responding to it as this theory of language was being developed, right? And his idea is um, that language is inherently dialogic, right? It always presupposes an other, right? So therefore, when I make an utterance, that utterance might be posited within a given structure, but it, that utterance has to be dialogic. It can only mean something through the gaze of another, through the acceptance of another. And hence, beyond the structure, the utterance must have a recipient. And since it does need that, right, since an act of speech is dialogic, right, then there is something more than the structure at play in how we construe meaning, right? And this you will see also uh, in the first major critiques of structuralism that he cites, right? And, and that is uh, the critique of structuralism uh, coming from another French theorist, right? Whose idea is that, um, that whatever we say, right, it is always posited in a discourse. And the discourse is nothing but an individual utterance within a system of language. And when we go to that, then we start reading the text as a discursive practice as produced in a given discourse which you, me, and others read still structurally, but we can bring our own modes of reading to it, our own discursively produced ways of understanding text. And so increasingly, these critics are trying to create space for the individual reader. But here's the problem. The structuralist at their best, when they address the reader, they imagine this super reader, okay? First of all, the reader who would know the conventions of a language, because only then you could re read the individual signs and really understand them. That makes structuralist readings of the text, and Eagleton does give us some example. That makes it extremely specialized, right? He gives you an example of uh, a text read by Roman Jacobson and another who go and make these subtle structuralist readings of a text and make connections when Eagleton is saying, 
most scholars would have missed that. So what the structuralists are then imagining is the super reader, right? And what kind of a reader is it? I mean, this is a reader, an ideal reader, according to Eagleton, would need to be fully equipped with all the technical knowledge essential for deciphering the work. To be faultless in applying this knowledge and free of any hampering restrictions. That is the kind of reader the structuralists are imagining. And furthermore, if this model was pressed to extreme, he or she would have to be stateless, classless, ungendered, free of ethnic characteristics, and without limiting cultural assumptions, right? And hence, this reader, you know, completely independent, right? So, let me explain. I, I hope I have not confused you enough. In From page 90, 92 to the end of the text, what Eagleton lays out for us is, here is what structuralism gained, right? What were its gains? It demystified that whole idea of romantic readings of a text, right? It also emphasized that in order to understand a text, we need to understand the deeper structure within which it is posited and not necessarily bring in our own ideas or our own prejudices to the text. It also enables us to decenter the human subject, right? By suggesting that so much of what we understand and know is determined by the larger structure within which we exist. But in the process of doing that, their extreme focus on language and linguistic structures then makes structuralist readings of the text extremely depoliticized, right? And the kind of reader that they imagine, the super reader has to be apolitical, doesn't care about his or her gender, his or her social role, or the social role of act of production itself or material causes, all you do is read the deep structures within a text, right? And not many people have the, you know, know-how to do that. So literary crit criticism in this sense becomes even more technical, but more than that, while we are reading the structure of a fairy tale and everything else, all we are focusing on is the deeper structure, studying of the structure and how the story fits. There is no effort here, even though the possibility was there to read larger social structures and their implications. Structuralism never goes there, right? And it becomes even more apolitical and esoteric. Now, he also mentions in these pages the work by John Searle and J.L. Austin, who are considered the major theorists of the speech act theory, right? And the idea that most of the time language is also performative, right? And depending on who is speaking and saying what, we use language to express what we intend to do. I will eat this dinner, right? And that that in itself is a response to over-determining aspects of the lung itself, of the structure itself. So by the end of this chapter, Eagleton has given us then what are the gains of structuralism, how specialized it becomes, and the responses that are developing against it. More prominently, people who have started emphasizing the role of sociality of literature itself, the role of social structures, right? And the role of the location of the text within a given politics. But also constantly the reader is entering the text, but the reader is not entering the text as this idealized individual reader, but reader as produced by the sociopolitical. But peace and love, and thank you so much. Structures by class, by gender and sexuality as he or she exists. So that's kind of the entry into post-structuralism. So I hope this uh, chapter, part of the chapter, explains a bit from page 92 to the end of the chapter. Uh, I'm pretty sure I haven't done a good job of it. But if you have any questions 
anything that you would like to me to respond to, feel free to post a comment or send your questions my way, and I'll be very happy to answer those. Until then, thank you so much, and stay safe.